Hey there, welcome back to the Path to Zion podcast where we are rediscovering the ancient way. You can always find us over at pathtozion.com um, or of course on our YouTube channel. Thank you for those of you who are tuning in for the very first time. Um, we are all learning. I don't know much, but I'm trying to learn more every day and uh, hopefully you're in the same place. Now today we're going to talk about uh, an interesting approach to several things. We could use this according to everything in the Word, and um, specifically, we are in the vein right here, right this second, of entering into the Spring Feast. I just recorded um, a, an episode talking about um, the feasts and a call to remember them. They are an example, I would say, to uh, an invitation to remember and memorialize what Yahweh's done and what He's doing and what He's going to do. A beautiful picture of us that we have been invited to partake in and to remember. Um, if you've not watched that one, I would encourage you to go see it. Um, it should be um, just recently posted. And so what we're going to talk about today is just kind of right next door to this in the same vein of thought. Of course, as I'm saying, in our house, we're about to celebrate Passover. It's the spring season. It's a new year. Um, things are coming to life all around us, and it's a wonderful, wonderful time to remember and recount what Yahweh has done and the patterns that he has instated for his set apart people. And so we have two things, two different ways of, of thought here. And we're going to put the verse on the screen, verses. And, and we basically, we're presenting two approaches to what we're going to talk about here uh, very briefly today. One is we read about something, we hear someone present to us something that may be a foreign idea to us as something we need to consider as Christians. I don't consider myself Christian. I have to make that clear to some people, but I'm a follower of Messiah, and and I try to walk. I have a desire in my heart to walk out righteous deeds, works. Sorry, works. <laughs> um, the works of Abraham. Remember, you know that that Yeshua confronted the non-believing leaders towards. They, they said, "Are you talking about our father Abraham?" He said, "Look, man, if you, if Abraham was your father, you'd be doing the works that Abraham did. Works. Wait, I thought I thought the non-believing leaders that hated Jesus and couldn't embrace the Messiah and the gospel were horrible law keepers, ordinance keepers." No, friend, they were they were self-righteous lawbreakers who the only law that they cared about was their own. And so we're going to talk about that here in mere moments, but it boils down to two different ways, vantage points we can have. Any one of us that says, well, we don't have to do that. Sabbath is one big one. one we don't have to do the fourth commandment. Well, if, if you said to someone else, well, I don't have to keep from murdering someone. I don't have to. It's such a burden. <laughs> I've been freed from that burden in Jesus to take a man's life. Or, you know, like if we if we apply that to other commandments, it would sound absurd. But the fourth commandment, because of the traditions of men, is just, eh, well, we're in the Sabbath rest now. Move on. Number five, please. And so we hear often with regularity, or we have said it ourselves, or some of us are saying it right now, I don't have to do that. I don't have to do all those things in Jesus. But here's the question we're going to really highlight. One is a statement. I don't have to do that. And I'm going to make this a little more soft and gentle. I believe this is the more, this is the heart posture I want to have. And people that are in my life right now that Father has just orchestrated me to be, be alongside are willing to ask this question. Why wouldn't we want to? Why wouldn't we want to? And that is a real, I mean, heart check for any one of us. Why don't we want to do what so many righteous, set-apart, holy people that went before us did? Why are we so opposed? Now, there are many answers, many answers. Most of the answers can be found by realizing what we have inherited is a tradition of men doctrine. And everything else just kind of falls under that. We, Friends, we do what we've inherited. We do what we've been told is right, even if it's not right. If we're raised in a house and a culture and a nation where, I don't know, I could choose all these outlandish examples, but it's not really necessary. Something that is, is just obviously wrong, obviously wrong. But if you've been raised in a culture in a governmental order, in a way of life where that is right and acceptable, of course, you are going to do 
what you inherited is right to do. And that, friend, is the heart of what we are always putting our thumb on here on the program. Many of the things that we do here in Christianity is simply a demonstration, an ongoing demonstration of the strength of the traditions of men that Yeshua came and was constantly pointing out at every turn, ironically, to the teachers of the law, the non-believing Pharisees that Christianity says they hate. This is very complicated. This is, this is a complex idea. How, how similar Christianity and its teachings and doctrines, how similar they are to the non-believing pharisaical mindset. It's very, very, it's troubling, but it's, <laughs> that's a deep thing to examine, which we are not going to do today. So let's get started. Now, while there is a very strong contingent of people, a large uh, group of people that are waking up to Father's Feast, His Sabbaths, um, there's still millions of people, who, of course, of faith now, of, be of belief, who are abandoning them generation after generation. Um, due to poor teaching and bad dispensational doctrine, I understand that's what I inherited too. That's okay. We all have to start somewhere. Yes, we're all on a journey, hopefully. Whenever I have a chance to present our journey personally, I try to ask a lot of questions, um, such as we see here today. We, we don't have to do that anymore in Jesus versus, you know what? Why? What is this big apprehension and opposition in my heart? I'm not doing that. I'm not talking about circumcision. I'm not talking about burdensome laws like resting on the Sabbath or camping for Sukkot, tabernacles for eight days. I'm not doing that burdensome law requirement or sharing a wonderful meal with other believers and remembering the Passover and Yeshua's promise to do it again with us one day? Wow, such a burden. I'll do that. And everybody's done this who comes into the ancient way. I've heard it, you know, 567 times in the last five or six years. But like when you're sitting around the campfire at seven o'clock and you're, you're hanging out with whoever, however many people you have in, in your gathering, whether it's your family or a larger gathering, you're talking about the word, you're laughing, you're singing praise and, and adoration to the name of Yahweh Most High. You're remembering the works of Yeshua and how he came and Yahweh dwelt among us through his son and tabernacled with men and how we're going to do it again in the millennial kingdom. You look at a brother and you laugh and you say, boy, this sure is burdensome. <laughs> And I just wish people understood that that's what I'm talking about, as lighthearted as I can make it, but that's just where my heart is. Why don't we want to do these things? Well, we've not been presented it in its proper light, which is what my heart wants to do. I don't know how to do that very well, but let's try. Yahweh said in Exodus chapter 20, what? Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Keep it kadosh. I'm kadosh, Yahweh says. Keep this day kadosh. Remember it forever as a set apart day. It's not difficult, not too hard for us to do. We've been doing it for a little while now, and it's not that hard to do. Um, Leviticus, Leviticus chapter 23, talking about his appointed feasts. These are the appointed feasts of Yahweh that you shall proclaim as what? Holy convocations, holy set apart times. They are my, he says, my appointed feasts. They're his possession, his creation, okay, that he created for his people to enter into and share. Exodus chapter 12, verse 14, Yahweh states this, Passover specifically, because we're moving into that season here, so it is, of course, front and center. Passover shall be for you a memorial day, a day of remembering, and you shall keep it as a feast to Yahweh throughout your generations as a statute forever. A statute forever. You shall keep it as a feast. And so just these three little things are like we could we could spend, you know, a 10 part series on these as we can with most topics here. But it's not necessary. This is an invitation. If you want to look in the window and consider, then you're welcome to do so. If you want to slam the door, pull the blinds, pull the curtains, 
put on a deadbolt and say, I'm never going to, and continue to say, I don't have to do those things, friend, that's up to you. That's all of our individual responsibility. Um, but this is an invitation that we talked about in the last episode, an invitation to remember a beautiful extension of Father's character to whosoever will, whoever wants to join themselves um, with him, literally, by doing what he has instated. Now, I would say, as we've already talked about, one of the best questions arises when placed beside a statement, as we see here um, in the box um, with the text today. I believe that it is very pivotal for all of us to be found humbly willing to move from this those aren't for me um, in Messiah to simply asking, why would I not want, like why would I not truly desire to remember and celebrate Yahweh's appointed times? Why don't I want to do that? I, I, I humbly submit that to as many people who, who even look my direction of saying, like, friend, I don't understand why you don't want to. Like, I didn't want to because I was ignorant. I didn't want to because I didn't understand. For years, for years, we would say, several of us, I wish someone would, would explain and help us make sense of the feasts. What's the deal? We didn't understand. Right? I wish someone would explain and walk us through why they matter and and, and how in the world are they relevant to us today in this modern age, you know, as progressive Christians? And friends, I'm telling you, for whatever reason, the Father has opened my eyes to see answers to all those questions. Not all in the sense of I understand it all, but like, I understand my identity in Messiah now. I understand why Yeshua came. I understand why he was like, in many ways, he was like the Passover lamb, and in other ways, he was not. And that's okay. There are things in our understanding that, according to the Word, is, it becomes illuminated to us as we travel along studying and giving our lives to learn and to grow and to what? To change, friend. To change, which is what, of course, we're talking about here. So, this, I believe, this question about, like, if anyone's really willing to peer deep inside and say, you know what, why am I so opposed to these works to outward signs like circumcision, uh, signs of the covenant. If you're a son of Abraham, you do, you do what Abraham did. Yah, uh, Yeshua said that himself. If you want to be like him, you do what he did. And that's one of the things, which is a whole other issue, of course. If you want to be my set-apart holy people, you do what I said my holy set-apart people do. We have these questions but we often fail to realize that Yahweh also gave us a clear answer. He gave us a clear response to the questions of how do we be holy as Yahweh himself is holy? How do we do that? Well, we've been told. But we have to be willing to say, maybe I have to change my understanding of who I am and what I'm supposed to be tending to right here, right now, in Yeshua, in Messiah, in the, the beginning stages of the unfolding of the new covenant promises, okay? So, I believe this allows a conversation to begin well, um, hopefully, um, when we see that this is not at all about what we have to do, <laughs> but rather a joyful response <laughs> to the incredible invitation of what we get to do. We've talked about that endlessly. Like if we could go right into the heart of like what people have dubbed the, the new church, the, the post-ascension church, you know, the Acts church, <laughs> these people couldn't believe that they could leave behind the ways of the Goyim nations, the Gentile nations, their old pagan idolatrous ways, and do Passover. And they could go to the synagogue and they could listen to someone read the Torah from the chair of Moses and then get up and get counsel from, well, we'll get to that. Okay, well, let's get to that right here in one more paragraph anyway. Moving on, identity issues are again the problem at hand um, in this discussion. Christianity has taught us that we're some unique post-resurrection people that must remain disconnected from all things that we've been told are Jewish, okay? Thanks a lot, Catholicism, is what I added in the commentary this morning. Boy, did they succeed in 
just manhandling and grabbing the the set apart assembly. Holy cow, was that successful? And the Christians don't even know it. Evangelicals don't even know it. It was perfect. Ugh, I hate it. Anyway, not here to tear that down. It's a big old beast system. <laughs> This, however, is simply just bad theology if, if we really give what the Word says credit only and not the traditions of men. Um, as I repeat with great regularity here, one cannot joyfully receive covenantal blessings and privileges that clearly in the Word are for Israel, yet entirely reject the covenantal requirements and responsibilities of the exact same identifiable people. How in the world do we as Christians in Jesus get all the benefits and perks that were promised to Israel, but we just don't have to do anything at all like they had to because we're in Jesus now? This is horrible theology, friend. Really, really bad doctrine that we need to unhitch from um, a little bit more. It doesn't work that way. There is now one man in Messiah we're presently scattered amongst all the nations. There's an end gathering coming. Praise Yahweh. It's coming one day. A covenant people that the immediate centuries after Messiah ascended, these people knew that. They understood the tribal understanding. They understood the end gathering. They understood the scattering. They understood the, the dispersing of the nations. We've not really inherited much towards that, if anything. This is why they've celebrated the feasts together. <laughs> um, this is why the Jerusalem Council instructed men post-Messiah via Torah commandments. We talked about that recently too, Acts chapter 15. What should we do? We got all these people coming in here. How in the world are we to live now? They're asking us questions. We don't know what to do. We don't know who we are. Help us. Well, this is what you do, said the Jerusalem Council. You go to the heart of the Torah, and you don't do this, and you don't do this, and you don't do that. And as we talked about in a recent episode, I can't remember the name, but we'll put it up here um, in the link. They said, thank you. You have shown us what is good. Right? They rejoiced at being told what they couldn't do anymore. Boy, is that a switch. We talked about that already. But this is why these people, post-Messiah, post-resurrection, post-ascension, this is why that they gathered together in the synagogues and in house to house. This is why they celebrated the feast together. This is why the Jerusalem Council point, pointed them to Torah commandments on how to live post-Messiah. We have been taught that Yahweh's wonderful ways, wonderful ways, were heavy burdens that no man can bear. If you watch the program, you're probably tired of me saying that. But we have inherited a belief system that says that Yahweh's Torah commands are the burdens that no man can bear that Paul and others were talking about. Friend, this is bad, bad theology again. If you notice the theme here, most don't know this, but ironically, as we already alluded to a little bit at the beginning, Christianity primarily operates under the exact same system that Messiah was always calling out with the non-believing leaders. This is why I said this as an example, Mark chapter 7, because here we are, we're talking about what we have to do. I don't have to do that versus, man, I get to do that. And like, as we talk about Passover and Easter and how they're not at all the same. And so like Easter is what? It's a tradition of men. It is an addition. It is not a biblical, biblically commanded feast day by Yahweh's own naming. He, he never talked about it at all, ever. Mark chapter 7 says, You leave the commandment of Elohim, you hold on to the tradition of men. You have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of Elohim in order to what? Establish your own tradition. Oh, this, friends, we have to hold this soberly. By establishing our own traditions of men, it continues, thus making void the word of Elohim. In case we didn't get it the first time, it's redundant by your tradition that you have handed down. Friend, let me just ask you, not everyone is exempt from this, but the majority who would watch this program and others that will never even know that this program exists would say, if I said to the, for the majority of Christians in this nation and many others, if not all, 
Did you inherit Passover or Easter as a tradition? Every time, let's say 999 out of 1,000 would say, oh, Easter. We always did Easter. My secular neighbors did Easter. Okay, everybody does Easter. Friend, it's a tradition of men. No one would argue that point. Even people who like do Easter, but well, I know it's I know it's not a biblical holiday, but you don't celebrate the the resurrection of Jesus. Well, we'll get to that too. But there is a cost, and that's part of it, I guess. Is a good a good connection. There's a cost to look foolish in the eyes of people who make you try to sound like you don't believe the Bible or you don't love Jesus. You don't love Jesus. It's the same thing because I don't celebrate Mother's Day. You don't even love your mom? <laughs> I love my mom dearly, but I don't ascribe to the nations telling me how I have to show her. I know, I'm odd. It's okay. One has to be willing to admit that we have counted the cost of, in a bad way, of missing out on the wonderful blessing of Yahweh's appointed times, His feast days. Um, why? Because we've exalted our own traditions over his, is what we've done um, for generations and generations, so much so now, it's very minimally even questioned. It's starting to again, um, but for the most part, in my generation, <coughs> you didn't question Easter. Of course you do Easter. Why would you not? Well, it's kind of has pagan origins, and like it's nowhere in the Bible, like as a celebratory event. I don't care. You do Easter, boy. <laughs> I mean, everybody knew that, of course. But one must be found, all of us have to be found willing to leave man-made traditions like Easter celebrations and fight these strong pulls on our heartstrings. Like I said earlier, it's easier for some than for others. I understand that. We're not full of, you know, it's not like we don't have compassion towards us. We understand Okay, I understand the pull. I understand the draw. I wish, I wish I could just many times just jump into being accepted by friends and family because I just let's just you know whatever we would never do it. But like my heart, because I don't want segregated and separated in the sense of put out because I don't believe like everybody else. I don't like that. Don't find comfort in that. But I can't go back and just celebrate the traditions of men just to appease friends and family. I mean, I couldn't do that with a clear conscience. Um, I don't believe that's required of us. So how do we manage that? Well, that's a whole other issue. But I understand that there, there are strong roots in our hearts towards these traditions of men that we've been handed. De dear, Christmas is another one, man. We've talked about that here for years and years. We haven't done Christmas here for 10 years. I understand the severity of cutting that off and and, and calling it what it is. I understand. Um, but to be absolutely clear, yes, we, we can, of course, honor and exalt the resurrection of Messiah. Yes, of course. Yes. <laughs> it's a wonderful, wonderful, huge part and piece of the gospel account. Yes, of course. But it was never a biblically commanded, memorialized feast. It was never a replacement feast, biblically. And that's all I'm saying. Let's just simplify. We're not overcomplicating this. We're actually trying to make this quite simple. We're not saying the birth of Yeshua doesn't matter. We're saying that Christmas as a, as a feast, holiday, holy day was never prescribed by Yahweh. Passover, Sukkot, Shavuot, these are. That's all we're saying. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> this is very simple. To repeat, to be clear, one does not have to memorialize and celebrate the resurrection of Messiah, Easter, in order to rightly remember and honor his resurrection. We're not abandoning the works of our Messiah. We're not abandoning the things that have happened in the Bible. All we're saying is they're not memorials. They're not memorialized observances for all generations like Yahweh's feasts are. That's what we're trying to get to the heart of differentiating between. Okay? I believe in the birth of Jesus, yes. But I also don't believe that Christmas is anything other than uh, a created feast and festival of men, a tradition of men. Okay? They don't have to go hand in hand. Now, 
The majority of people don't have any issue celebrating festivals and traditions that aren't biblically commanded in any way whatsoever. Most people love that and, and just jump on board because that's okay. that is somehow okay. Um, but many don't consider memorializing and celebrating Yahweh's appointed times. His feast. Again, because we've been told that Jesus already somehow mystically fulfilled them all. They're, they're done away with now. They're done. We have Jesus. We don't need those, which goes back to our main question statement at the beginning. Um, if you have questions about the origin of the appointed times, I would suggest you go find our Moedim series and look into that. Um, why? Well, they appear back at creation. Yahweh appointed the sun, moon, stars, the luminaries in the heavens to set mark and determine his appointed times, his moedim, his, his gatherings for his people. Set apart unique time for the Father to meet with his children. Let's just make it very simple. In conclusion, traditions run very deep. Very, very deep. We all know this, whether it's deep down in us and we live according to it, or we've recognized it and like, oh my goodness, I'm controlled by these things, whichever camp we fall into. I would say this is what Yeshua was always encountering when he dealt with the accusations of the non-believing leaders of his day. Sadly, those in that time who held on to their own traditions, they, they had already abandoned Yahweh's ways, and they had perpetuated their own. And by doing so, as we talked about, they made void the word of Elohim. That's why this is so serious. This is not just replacing for the sake of, like, they're synonymous. They're somehow um, interchangeable. Passover and Easter are not in any way interchangeable. They're just not. They're not the same at all. One is the, the fabrication of men, and one is the creation and instating of Yahweh Elohim himself. Um, and this is what Yah, uh, Yeshua was constantly confronting, and we have to realize we have done the same thing, especially when we ask... The, when we have this statement of, well, I don't have to do that anymore, as opposed to saying, you know, let me look in my heart and find out why I don't want to, which is, to me is the greater response. Um, the result of all this has caused us to miss remembering Father's wonderful ways. Um, the celebrating, <laughs> the beauty of literally living lives, day-to-day -day lives, literal lives, literal, literal activities, who set us apart as a holy called out people. It is our attribute. It is a marker. It is a sign upon us, literally, that we are just different. We live according to an ancient way where Yahweh's set apart people do set apart things. Um, I want to help continue change that, friend. How about you? Or where are you um, in consideration of this? Which camp do you fall in, A or B? Uh, maybe you're somewhere in between asking questions, which is a wonderful place to be. We have to all start there. We want to join into the righteous men of old who declared with, our, with literal lives um, the wonderful ways of Yahweh Elohim, memorializing his feast, remembering. We too will celebrate his feasts and not the festivals of men here in our house. Um, we join with, with others who do likewise. Um, it's a beautiful gift of, of sojourning out of the nations and becoming in mere increment now a sojourning people, um, joining in with those who went before us, awaiting a city that's just, it's just not here yet. It is in the, in the yet to be for us in the future. I believe that it takes all of us to enter into this with a humble heart and a willing, willingness to ask, as we said, well, you know what? Why wouldn't I want to celebrate Yahweh's feast? Not in a casual, flippant way, but just in a way of a heart's posture of saying, you know what? Maybe I need to let my guard down and my opposition down towards these things and say, you know what? I'm not above missing out on something that Yahweh has for me that I just didn't see yesterday. If that's you, friend, be encouraged. Why? If you don't celebrate Yahweh's appointed times, if you don't do Passover, would you just ask, you know what? Why don't I? Why don't I? Why don't I keep father's appointed times because the creator of the whole earth and the sky and the heavens wants to set a timer and come meet in a special way with his special people so his feast season is quickly coming into view friend for this 
latest year that is upon us. Won't you please consider remembering and celebrating with us? You've been watching the Path Design podcast or listening over at pathdesign.com. We are rediscovering the ancient way. Click around. We've got over 500 episodes here. Maybe some of them are still worth, worth watching or listening to. Um, join us over at pathdesign.com and into the conversation should one unfold here. Thank you so much for watching. Amen.